concluded. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. When can the Prime Minister guarantee Australians that the cost of their power bills will go down? The Minister for Prime Minister will resume his seat. Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Goldstein is warned. The member Minister for Energy and the Environment will cease interjecting and denying the Prime Minister the call. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, if uh, the Leader of the Opposition is to be taken at his word, his renewable energy objective would result in a $66 billion subsidy. <laughs> $66 billion subsidy to be imposed on Australian families, a subsidy that is completely unnecessary, a subsidy which is effectively industry policy pouring billions of dollars in additional costs onto Australian families. That is what, that's his policy. Now what we're doing is committed to ensuring that our energy policy delivers affordable for power, Kingston. reliable power, and that we meet our international commitments. Yeah, yeah. And we've just seen, we've just seen, we're taking up the recommendations of the, the Energy Security Griffith. Board. The members of whom were applauded by the member for Port Adelaide when they were appointed. Oh, we welcome them. Say? Leading experts in the, the field. The Prime Minister will <laughs> resume his seat. I again say to the Minister for the Environment and Energy, he's being far too loud. I don't need the help of members on my left. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Thanks, Speaker. It's on direct relevance. You don't get a more specific direct question than this one. The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. Uh, I, it was a short uh, question. It didn't have a preamble. I concede that, but I'm listening very closely to the Prime Minister. The requirement is the Prime Minister to be relevant to the question. I believe he's being relevant. It's not for him to answer it to the satisfaction of the questioner. Uh, he's on the policy topic, and uh, I'll call the Prime Minister. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, the. Uh, uh, the Leader of the Opposition will have to uh, reflect on the expert advice of the Energy Security Board. Yeah, yeah. This is someone who has called for bipartisanship in energy policy. That's what he's called for. And what we have is a recommendation from an expert board appointed by COAG, appointed by more Labor governments than uh, coalition governments. And this is what they have said in their formal advice. It's expected that following the guarantee could lead to a reduction in residential bills in the order of $110 to $115 per annum over the 2020-30 period. Wholesale prices are expected to decline by 20 to 25 per cent per annum over the same period. Compared to the clean energy target as specified in the Finkel Review, this guarantee could be expected to lead to wholesale prices that are on average 8 to 10 per cent lower under that period. Now, Mr Speaker, we have arranged for the opposition to have a briefing from the Energy Security Board. We uh, look forward to them getting fully briefed and we encourage them to get on board and adopt this expert recommendation that has come that for the first time will level the playing field end the subsidies, end the taxes, ensure that we have ensure that we have a genuinely technology agnostic energy market that enables us to have energy that is affordable, reliable and responsible. That's what Labor should support. Stop the nonsense about their claim bipartisanship and get real and get on board with a plan that guarantees Australia's energy future. The member for Isaacs will cease interjecting. The member for Griffith is now warned. And the member for Latrobe has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Prime Minister. 
Will the Prime Minister advise the House how the government's national energy guarantee will ease the pressure on power bills, guarantee reliability and reduce emissions for hard-working Australian families and businesses, including in my electorate of Latrobe? What would be the impact of alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, and I, I thank the honourable member for his question. And we all know very well what the impact of Labor's policies have been. What we have seen is unaffordable power and unreliable power. We've just come, we've just come from a press conference where the energy market operator, Audrey, Audrey Zebelman, has described how she has to intervene again and again in the South Australian market to keep the lights on because of the instability in that market created by the force feeding of masses of intermittent renewables like wind without any regard for stability or backup or storage. What, you've, what we've seen with the Labor Party's approach to energy has been a triumph of ideology over good sense. What we need now is the engineering and the economics. That is what guides our energy policy, and we have seen the work of engineers and economists on the Energy Security Board with their recommendation. Now, Mr Speaker, the National Energy Guarantee, recommended by the Energy Security Board, established by COAG as one of the recommendations of the Finkel Review. And Mr Speaker, what that ensures is that Australians will be able to afford to pay their electricity bill and that the lights will stay on. That is vitally important, and by combining both climate and energy policy, you have a mechanism that ensures we deliver a commitment to cut our emissions in accord with Paris and, at the same time, the reliability that we need. And Mr Speaker, what that will do is bring more investment into the system, an investment of every kind. Investment in coal, in gas, in renewables, in storage. It is a genuine level playing field. The subsidies have got to come to an end. The, the clean energy sector, the renewable sector, say they say they say that they are competitive, and so they are. So they are, and now, Mr. Speaker, they have the opportunity to compete. Mr. The Speaker, as members, Dr. Dr. The members Kerry Schott, for Fenner, Prime Minister no. will just resume his seat for a second. The members for Fenner, Barton, Whitlam, and Hotham will not hold up signs during question time, otherwise they'll be holding them up back in their office. They're warned. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As uh, Dr Kerry Schott, the chair of the Energy Security Board, said this will place downward pressure on wholesale prices. 20 to 25 per cent reduction in wholesale prices for Bruce forecast is warned. by the Energy Security Board. Member and for Barton will leave through, under 94A. That flows through into Member for Barton will leave under 94A. Bill. And that, of course, is Prime part Minister of resume his seat. I've asked the member for Barton to leave under 94A. That's why I asked the Prime Minister to resume his seat. So she's in no doubt. I've now asked her three times to leave under 94A. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this this. Uh, energy guarantee, this national energy guarantee, what this does is work with all of our other measures on retail bills, on gas, on the abolition of the limited merits review. Every lever that can be pulled to reduce the Prime uh, energy Minister's prices, time has my concluded. government Just before I call the member for Port Adelaide, if you could just bear with me for a second, I'd just like to advise the House. Uh, we have joining us in the gallery this afternoon the Ambassador uh, of Brazil. On behalf of all members, I extend a very warm welcome. And also uh, former member for Maranoa, Mr Ian Cameron, uh, who is with us today. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you both. The member for Port Adelaide. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and Energy. Can the minister confirm that the government does not have any detailed modelling of the impacts of what is now government policy? The Leader of the House will cease interjecting. The Minister for Energy and Environment. Mr Speaker, I can confirm to the House that the 
Energy Security Board, which is made up of the Australian Energy Regulator, the Australian Energy Market Operator and the Australian Energy Market Commission, have written to the government and outlined that on the basis of their analysis that prices will fall for an average household by a hundred to a hundred and fifteen dollars, Mr Speaker. By a hundred and hundred to hundred and fifteen dollars per annum per annum between twenty twenty and twenty thirty. But Mr Speaker Mr Speaker, I'm asked I'm asked by the member for Port Adelaide. Members on my left. And we think that he's a fan of the clean energy target. But we know that the clean energy target's reduction in power bills is not as good as the advice from the Energy Security Board on this new appointment. But this Energy Security Board is a very important board. It's a very important board. And guess who said when they were appointed to these positions that they were, quote, excellent appointments? Who said that? Who said that? Who said it? The member for Port Adelaide, Mr Speaker. And who said Mr. Speaker, who said that a clean energy target was the second best option, Mr. Speaker? Who said that? The member for Port Adelaide, Mr. Speaker. The member for Port Adelaide. But this is member so for McMahon. This, this is the piece de resistance, Mr. Speaker. Who said that the government is not listening to the energy experts, Mr. Speaker? The member for Port Adelaide, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, who else said? Who else said about renewables that they will be able to stand on its own two feet and compete in the market without subsidy from government, Mr Speaker? That was again the member for Port Adelaide, Mr Speaker. So the question to the Leader of the Opposition, who turns his back because he doesn't like to hear the truth, is why has the Labor Party signed up to a $66 billion subsidy if they believe that the renewables are the most cost-effective supply of new generation. And why has the Labor Party support, signed up to a $66 billion if they believe that the clean energy target is the second best option? Hypocrisy by name, hypocrisy by nature. This is the modern Labor Party. Members on both sides, the member the member for Banks has the call. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer advise the House on the benefits of the government's national energy guarantee and how this will relieve the cost pressures on hard-working Australian families and businesses by delivering affordable and reliable energy? How does this compare with alternative approaches? The Treasurer has the call. Thank Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for Banks for his question. The, the National Energy Guarantee is the unanimous recommendation of the Independent Energy Security Board, set up by COAG on the recommendation of the Finkel Report, and it will give Australians what they are asking for: reliable energy at a lower cost that meets our environmental obligations. It is estimated that the independent, by the Independent Board, to deliver savings of up to $115 per household per year, Mr Speaker. This is a game changer. Mr Speaker, this takes us into a new era for energy, a post-subsidy era where Australians, where families, where households, where businesses will no longer be forced to pay for these ideological driven subsidies, Mr Speaker, that they no longer need to pay as a result of the policies of this government. Mr Speaker, we are removing these costs from the system. And the electricity bill, by contrast, the electricity bill you will get from the Labor Party will be $66 billion in higher subsidies driven by ideology, not by economics, not by engineering, but just from the sheer ideology of the Labor Party. They are not subsidies that need to be paid to meet our environmental obligations. They are subsidies that will be imposed by the Labor Party, by this Leader of the Opposition, on families, on businesses, on households, to the tune of thousands of dollars for each one of those families, Mr Speaker, over that period. 
And they do this, they do this, they nail their colours to the mast of the uh, clean energy target on the basis that it would deliver certainty, Mr. Speaker, and it would deliver on our environmental obligations. But what they do know is that it will not deliver a CET on reliability, on affordability. The ACCC chairman, Rod Sim, said clearly if you want to solve for affordability, it's not the clean energy target that's going to do it. The clean energy target involves a subsidy which has to be paid for, which is smeared across all users. Labor have given up on reliability and they've given up on affordability, all in the name of putting uh, subsidies before the idol of, their, ide, idol of their own ideology, Mr Speaker. But on top of that, they say that the set will deliver certainty. Well, I'm pleased to quote the, chair, the chief executive of the Business Council of Australia, who said today the national energy guarantee will provide more and certainty than the clean energy target. The government plan has a great potential to deliver affordable, reliable power, reduce emissions and boost market confidence, and we are looking forward to the further work, Mr Speaker. This government has a plan for reliable, affordable energy that delivers on our environmental obligations. The Labor Party has a plan for an electricity bill of $66 billion on families, households and business. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Treasurer, what did the regulatory impact statement, which must have been considered as part of the decision announced today, find would be the impact on the economy of the Prime Minister's latest policy compared to a clean energy target? Members on my right. The Treasurer has the call. Regulatory impact statements, as the, the Shadow Minister and former Minister in the previous government know, are done as part of legislation. And that's pulled together, that is pulled together in the process as we go forward through the process with COED. Now, Mr. Speaker, what we what we have done today is we are adopting we are adopting the recommendation of the independent energy Member security board, the members of which were heralded and championed and cheered on by those opposite when they were appointed and when they come out with a recommendation that they don't like, Mr Speaker, will they turn on them like they turn on each other and as they will undoubtedly turn on this Leader of the Opposition, the Mr Treasurer Speaker? The Treasurer will resume his seat. Has the Treasurer concluded his answer? Has the, tre the Treasurer concluded his answer? It's the independent question. Members on my left, just before I call the member for Denison, the member for McMahon, the Leader of the House, I'd also like to inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon Mr Ken Jasper AM, the former state member for Murray Valley. On behalf of the House, I extend a warm welcome. And also, having just joined us in the gallery this afternoon, we have a visiting parliamentary delegation from Vietnam led by Madam Mai. On behalf of the House, I also extend a very warm welcome to all of you. The member for Denison. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, the TPI Federation has written to you repeatedly seeking a resolution to the dreadful situation where about 28,000 totally and permanently incapacitated veterans have seen their economic loss compensation fall to just 65 per cent of the minimum wage. Prime Minister, given the gravity of this issue and the Parliamentary Budget Office's validation of the independent analysis supporting the claim by the TPI Federation, Will you now take personal responsibility and intervene to facilitate an immediate increase of $176 a week in the economic loss compensation payments to Australia's TPI veterans? The Prime Minister has the call. Yes, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. Uh, Mr Speaker, my grandfather was a member of the TPI Federation, and I know well the work of the Federation and respect the advocacy they provide, and particularly that of TPI President Pat McCabe. Uh, all Australians are immensely proud of our men and women in uniform. We thank them for their service, and we owe them a debt we can never repay. Ensuring our veterans have adequate support and compensation is a vitally important role of government, and one to which I am personally deeply committed. In gratitude for their service, the government provides $12 billion annually in pensions and services to veterans and their families. 
We best honour the diggers of 1917 by providing the best support in every respect to the servicemen and women and the veterans and their families of 2017. Now, the honourable members raised the TPI pension in relation to the minimum wage. I can advise the honourable member that the TPI pension is currently $1,373.80 per fortnight. I'm further advised that more than 80 per cent of TPI pension recipients also receive income support payments, known as the service pension, of up to $894.40 per fortnight. It's important to recognise the TPI pension is part of a package of benefits available to veterans, which can also include additional income support payments and medical coverage for all health conditions through their gold card. Now, in recognition of this important issue, I've asked the Minister for Veterans Affairs to work with his department and the TPI Federation to analyse the basis of the Federation's research and the data used in it. And I want to thank the honourable member for raising these important issues and for the TPI Federation's ongoing role in representing the interests of Australia's veterans. Now, Mr Speaker, my government will always do the right thing by our veterans. I recognise there are various components to these entitlements and compensation, but I'm less interested in the definitional, definitional distinctions that, as a former serving officer, the honourable member would no doubt have a keen insight into than I am in making sure our veterans have the support they need. I'm also interested in making sure they have financial support that is appropriate and commensurate with their service, and that if they need medical support and treatment, it is provided. And if they need psychological support uh, for mental illness, it is provided too. I can assure the honourable member and all our veterans that my government is committed to them, just as they were committed to our nation in their days in uniform. The member for Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Environment and Energy. Hard-working families, retirees and small businesses in Gilmore are worried about energy costs. Will the minister update the House on the government's national energy guarantee and how it will deliver an affordable and reliable supply of energy across our nation? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Gilmore for her question and note her deep concern about rising power prices and the impact it is having on families across her electorate. And this is why today's announcement about a national energy guarantee is a major breakthrough. It will provide reliable, affordable power as we transition to a lower emissions future. It is credible, it is workable, it is pro-market and it will lower electricity prices. And importantly, it means no more subsidies, no taxes and no trading schemes, Mr Speaker. And it will deliver on the basis of the advice of the Energy Security Board, a board of experts, savings of up to $115 per annum, Mr Speaker. It builds on the work that the coalition is already undertaking to reduce the power prices as a result of increased network costs. And yesterday's decision by the Senate to pass our legislation to abolish limited merits review was important there. The work we've been doing with the retailers to save millions of Australian families hundreds of dollars a year. The work we have done with the gas suppliers to ensure that Australians get access to gas first before it is shipped overseas. And we have seen a fall, significant fall in the spot price, Mr Speaker. But the Labor Party believes in more subsidies—$66 billion worth of additional subsidies, Mr Speaker. They did nothing when they were in government to cut the network costs. They've done nothing when they were in government to cut the retailer costs, and they did nothing when they were in government to heed the warnings about increasing gas exports. No wonder the power bills increased by more than 100 per cent when Labor were in office. Now we know that, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the leader of the opposition, don't listen to what he says, but watch what he does, Mr. Speaker. 
because he said he was in favour of a better deal for education, but he voted against our Gonski reforms. He said he was in favour of lowering company taxes, but he voted against our reforms. He said he was in favour of better childcare benefits, but he tried to stop our reforms. And now he says he's in favour of greater investment certainty in the energy sector. Well, this is a test of his ticker, Mr Speaker. This is a test of the Leader of the Opposition's ticker. Will he stand up for Australian families? Will he follow the advice of the experts? Will he adopt a bipartisan approach to ensure that power bills for millions of Australian families are lower and that we get the investment certainty in the energy sector that this the country desperately needs? The Minister's time has concluded. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his previous answer. Is the Treasurer aware that the Office of Best Practice Regulation states, and I quote, all cabinet submissions require a regulatory impact statement? RISs are also required for all decisions made by the Australian government and its agencies that are likely to have a regulatory impact on businesses, community organisations, or individuals. Treasurer, do you stand by your previous answer? Why is there no regulatory impact statement for the government to release? Members on my right, the Minister for Energy and Environment will cease interjecting, as will the Leader of the House. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I can advise the House that the Cabinet submission, of course, is prepared consistent with the Cabinet Policy Handbook and the requirements of the process, Mr Speaker. I could ask, though, that the Shadow Treasurer when he introduced cash for clunkers. What was the regulatory impact statement on that, Mr Speaker? What was the impact statement on being the worst immigration minister in the history of the Australian Federation, Mr Speaker? That's 50,000 people, half of them who turned up on his own watch, and $11.6 billion in blowouts of expenditure we were created on his watch, Mr Speaker. Did he put that in the Cabinet submission when he went in there and he asked for his failed policies we should approve this because we're going to blow out the cost by 11.6 billion people and see thousands of people die at sea, Mr. Speaker. Here's another failed the immigration minister. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if there is, on direct relevance, if there is no regulation impact statement, mm. the Treasurer should say so and sit down. The Manager yeah. of Opposition Business can't compel the Treasurer to answer in a way other than he's being relevant to the question. The Leader of the House will cease interjecting. The Treasurer was asked a question about uh, regulatory impact statements, and he is talking about regulatory impact statements, as I hear him, and he's in order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I, remind, the House, I remind the House that this is the government that has responded to the independent Energy Security Board the Independent Energy Security Board that has come forward with a recommendation that has said the way to deliver cheaper electricity prices, more reliable electricity prices, more affordable electricity prices, and do it in a way without burdening the, uh, the public with unnecessary subsidies that are only required because of the ideological vanity of the Leader of the Opposition and the ideologues who sit opposite. Who each day, Mr. Speaker, who each day want to worship at the altar of this ideology that is putting subsidies, subsidies in the hands of companies paid for by householders who don't have to do it, Mr. Speaker. So there's a simple question for the leader of the opposition: Will he abandon? Will he abandon the failed policy approach that they have stuck to for so many years and join with the government? Join with the government and say to the Coag Council that this is to what the way to ensure we get reliable, affordable electricity for households and businesses, which also meet our environmental targets, Mr Speaker, because that is what this plan delivers. It, it delivers a plan that came out initially of the Finkel report, who said we should set up the Energy Security Board. And the Energy Security Board, which was set up by COAG as a result of that recommendation of the Finkel report, has looked at all of those recommendations and it has come forward with this being the answer as to how you deal with these issues. So I know the Leader of the Opposition, who wants to impose a $66 billion electricity bill on the Australian public, will not move away from his pride. 
and will not stand down, Mr. Speaker, but he should in the interests of families and of businesses who need the certainty that he has lectured this government about for so long, Mr. Speaker. He should, he should listen to the Australian people on this and he should put aside this ideological vanity and decide to commit to lower prices because this pan plan will deliver lower the prices. The Treasurer's time has concluded. Just before I call the member for Wide Bay, I'd also like to advise the House that we have in the Southern Gallery this afternoon 23 members of the War Widows Guild of Australia. On behalf of the House, a warm welcome to you all. The member for Wide Bay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources, Resources in Northern Australia. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on the importance of delivering an affordable and reliable energy supply to regional Australia? What action is the government taking to put downward pressure on energy prices for hard-working farming families? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question and note that he would be very interested in how we are making sure that people in the Weatherboard 9 are gimpy are getting affordable and reliable power and that how the coalition is working towards that and how the people in Maryborough are getting affordable and reliable power so they can stay in a job and the people in Kandanga and the people in Kilkeven because we on this side believe that the people working at Downer Rail are not politically incorrect, that people who have blue collar jobs are not politically incorrect. We believe that they still deserve a job. We understand Member quite clearly has been that you are either going to have cheap power, cheap wages or no jobs. So we are going to make sure that people maintain their jobs in the manufacturing industry. And we know that so far the Labor Party have come up with one thing. They've come up and their biggest, their biggest attack point so far is that they say, where's your regulatory impact statement? Well, that is it. Can't you imagine them at the Manic Monkey Cafe, where, where Dewdrop is talking to Moonbeam and says the coalition does not have a regulatory impact statement? That is about the extent of their concerns of blue-collar workers' jobs. We have 66 billion reasons, 66 billion reasons to make sure that those people who are doing it tough do not get the Labor Party bill. The Labor Party bill. Because the Labor Party bill makes people poorer. There is no doubt about it. A Labor Party bill will make you poorer. If you are doing it tough in the Hunter Valley, Hunter Valley, a Labor Party bill will make you poorer. If you are doing it tough in Shortland, a Labor Party bill will make you poorer. Without a shadow of a doubt, the Labor Party is now run by those with a philosophical ilk of the Manic Monkey Cafe, basket weaver number one, and all their friends, all their friends running a power policy that is going to drive blue-collar workers out of a job. And you can see it in Queensland now has the new mantle of the dearest power prices. They've taken over from South Australian Labor. So Queensland Labor now beats South Australian Labor as the most effective power policy, labor policy, to put you out of a job. Now we have brought forward a, we have brought forward a policy today which shows that we are not scared of coal fire power. We're going to make sure that coal fire power still remains in the mix. We're going to make sure that there is a capacity of baseload power to keep people in a job. We stand behind blue collar workers and their jobs, something that the Labor Party has absolutely given up on. They are bereft of the soul that they once had under Curtin and Chifley. They no longer believe in the people that they were actually put here to represent. And they turn their back. They turn their back on the working class people every day. Every day they turn their back on the working class people and they look towards the basket weavers. They turn their back, they face the basket weavers and they take their dollar. Member for Grainler. The Leader of the Opposition. Are my questions to the Prime Minister. So far today, the Prime Minister has refused to guarantee that prices will fall. Does that mean that the so-called National Energy Guarantee has no guarantee, no modelling and no regulatory impact statement? What is the point of a National Energy Members Guarantee if the Prime Minister cannot guarantee that power prices will go down? Yeah. Members on my right, the member for Gilmore, the Prime Minister has a call. Mr Speaker, I've never seen anyone so, so bereft of a feather to fly with than the Leader of the Opposition. 
He doesn't have a policy. He has nothing. Just a bunch. Just a bunch of, of, of whines and complaints. He has no plan for Australia's energy future at all, other than if you assume that all of us intend the necessary consequence of our actions, then he, this is what he intends. He intends more blackouts. He intends higher prices. He intends less reliability, because that is what his policies have all delivered in the past and we don't need to theorise. Now, Mr Speaker, we've just heard from the Energy Market Commission Chairman John Pearce, former Treasury Secretary in New South Wales. We've heard from him, so we've heard from him that this will be a much simpler uh, system to implement for retailers than a clean energy target, because it operates within the existing market mechanism. So he's, heard, he's given that. The regulator has given it a big regulatory tick. We've just heard from Audrey Zebelman, the Australian energy market operator, about how often she has to intervene in the South Australian market to force gas-fired power generators to come on stream at the highest possible cost at peak prices in order to keep the lights on in Adelaide and South Australia. And that is why she's advocating this reliability guarantee that will ensure that the market will be stable and that prices will be low. Now, honourable members have asked what impact is this going to have on prices in the near term? Well, let me quote John Pearce again. John Pearce made the point. He made the point that energy companies don't set their prices based on Member the for law price law today. It's based on the forward prices for electricity. And because of there has been so much uncertainty surrounding the investment climate, because the only, the only new energy that has been coming into the market has been intermittent renewables, wind and solar, because of that, forward prices have been high. And what Pierce has said, what John Pierce has said, is that once COAB commits to this, once the mechanism is agreed to, you will see more investment, greater certainty, forward prices coming down, and that's why he's forecasting a 20 to 25 per cent reduction in wholesale prices over the period. We have the smartest minds in the industry, the regulators and the operators, who are telling us we're not claiming, we're not the making that claim. Prime we're Minister's relying time on the smartest minds. The member for McEwen will cease interjecting, as will the member for McMahon. The member for Forrest has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the minister advise the House how the government will meet Australia's international commitment on carbon emissions while ensuring reliable and affordable energy for all Australians? The Minister for Foreign Affairs has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Forrest for her question. The Turnbull government's priority is to ensure that all Australians and Australian businesses are provided with affordable and reliable electricity. We're also committed to meeting our international obligations when it comes to reducing emissions. And Australia has a very strong record in setting and meeting and beating our international emissions targets. In fact, we have already exceeded our first Kyoto target by some 128 million tonnes, and we will exceed our second Kyoto target by 2020. Our Paris Agreement target is to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 per cent on 2005 levels by 2030. And, Mr Speaker, I am confident that we will do that because our national energy guarantee that was announced today and recommended by the Energy Security Board that was set up by COAG will ensure that Australian households and Australian businesses are able to be delivered with affordable and reliable electricity. And the guarantee is in two parts. The first supports the reliability 
of electricity. That is keeping the power on so that we don't see the blackouts as experienced by South Australia recently. The second part of it is about reducing emissions. So this is the integration of climate and energy policy that has been lacking for so many years. It will also ensure that there's appropriate investment in our electricity grid. Australia has abundant sources of energy and this national energy guarantee will ensure that we see investment in a range of um, electricity generation ideas and that we will reduce our emissions at the same time. Now, Mr Speaker, Labor's reckless plan to reduce emissions way beyond our international <coughs> obligations will not only drive up electricity bills, but it will threaten jobs, it will threaten household budgets and it will threaten future economic growth. Mr Speaker, the choice is clear. Labor will deliver higher electricity bills. The coalition will deliver affordable and reliable electricity. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that so far he has supported an emissions trading scheme and opposed it? supported an emissions intensity scheme and opposed it, ridiculed direct action and endorsed it, derided so-called clean, so clean coal and embraced it, supported a clean energy target and today abandoned it. When the, member, when the member for Warringah is calling the shots, how can any Australians believe anything this out-of-touch Prime Minister says about lowering power bills? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Pathetic. What a pathetic, what a pathetic question from the leader of the opposition. This is the Energy Security Board. Kerry Schott, AO Chair. Member for Claire Gordon. Savage, Deputy Chair. Both warmly welcomed by the member for Port Adelaide. Member John for Pierce, Isaacs. Chair of the Australian Energy Market Commission. Audrey Zebelman, CEO of the Australian Energy Market Operator. <coughs> Paula Convoy, Chair of the Australian Energy Regulator. And apparently they've all been caught up in some sort of political uh, conspiracy. <laughs> really, Mr Speaker, it's about time the Leader of the Opposition recognised that his pathetic political games have failed. His slogans have failed. His, his embracing of one three-letter acronym after the other without understanding what any of them mean has failed. And what Australians want to see is action. They want to see leadership. They want to see policy. They want to see real expertise. They want to see real expertise, and that is what we have received from the Energy Security Member Board. For Sydney. And we rely on that expertise to assure us that this will result in affordable, <coughs> reliable energy. It will keep the lights on in a way Labor failed to do. It will ensure prices come down in the way Labor failed to do. It will ensure that wholesale generation sees more supply and that the playing field is levelled and that the subsidies end and that the market is allowed to operate to deliver the most reliable and affordable power for Australians. Affordable, reliable and responsible energy. That's our plan. That's where we're taking the advice from the Energy Security Board so the opposition can play as much politics as they like. But they run head on into the reality that we have got those leading regulators and operators, those experts in the field, with their recommendation going to COAG, Labor should stop the politics and get onto the policy and back this plan. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. Will the minister update the House on why an affordable and reliable energy supply is crucial to delivering the government's national defence industry project? How would an unreliable energy supply risk the economic prosperity of this project and the creation of thousands of jobs? The Minister for Defence Industry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I've been to a lot of uh, footy games over the years at the parade to watch the Red Legs playing football. And I was just thinking during question time over the people who I sit with 
in the box there with Rita and with Mike, with uh, Ray and Beryl, with Mario and Vincenzina. And Mr. Speaker, I have to say, in all the years I've been going to Red Legs footy games, they've never stopped me and said, look, before I consider the government's policy, I've got to see a regulatory impact statement. <laughs> I've been in Palm for 24 years, Mr. Speaker. I've been to a lot of supermarkets. I've done a lot of door knocking. I've been to a lot of events, a lot of footy games. I've been to a lot of RSL functions. I can tell you I've been to a lot of War Widows Guilds events. No one's ever said to me, look, I'm sorry, but all I can say to the government's policy, you've got to show me your regulatory impact statement, Mr Speaker. And yet that's what we've been reduced to in this House today, caught out, caught out. because that's all the Labor Party has left, delving around in cabinet processes when the only issue that matters here today is affordable and reliable electricity prices, Mr Speaker. And the Turnbull government has taken the bull by the horns and is delivering reliable power, reducing our emissions and delivering affordable power, and Labor has been, left, has been found totally flat-footed by this Leader of the Opposition, who has led them into a political cul-de-sac where they've never done the hard work on policy no. since they lost the last election. They've not done any work to actually get to the bottom of real issues in government substance. All they do every day is think, how do we win the 24-hour news cycle and get on the television news tonight? Well, now, Mr Speaker, they have been found completely wanting because the Turnbull government, backed by the Energy Security Board, has come up with a solution to the only issue that the members of the public are talking to us about is how to overcome the mess left to us by Labor because of their ideological obsession exactly. with renewable energy, which they still continue to this day, where they desire to spend $66 billion of taxpayers' money on subsidies to wind and solar, which we now know are competitive with coal and gas, Mr Speaker. Because of ideology, they intend to waste $66 billion when instead they could get on board with the energy guarantee that will bring down prices and provide reliability, get on board with the emissions guarantee that will reduce our emissions and ensure that we are meeting our international targets. It's time to get on board Labor and support lower prices. The member for Port Adelaide. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. In just the last 12 months, <coughs> the Prime Minister was for an emissions intensity scheme until the member for Warringah came out against it, and he supported a clean energy target until the member for Warringah came out against that. Given reports that the member for Warringah spoke against the Prime Minister's latest energy policy in the party room today, when will the Prime Minister announce that he's against this one too? <laughs> The Minister for Energy and the Environment. You don't deserve an answer from the Prime Minister. For the last, for the last time I looked, the last time I looked, Labor was for a clean energy target. Before that, an emissions intensity scheme. Before that, a CPRS. Before that, an ETS. Before that, a $15 billion dreaded carbon tax, Mr Speaker, which, when we on this side of the House abolished, saw the greatest single drop in electricity prices ever recorded. Do you remember that great democratic forum like Pluto, Socrates, Aristotle and the Citizens' Assembly, Mr Speaker? Do you remember that one? Do you remember the cash for clunkers, Mr Speaker? Do you remember the pink bats, Mr Speaker? Do you remember spending billions of dollars to keep coal-fired power stations open and then spending billions of dollars to close them, Mr Speaker? I mean, what was the result of all that mess? What was the result of all that mess? A hundred per cent increase in power prices under the Labor Party, Mr Speaker. And then they had the hide to come into this place during the last sitting fortnight and tell mistruths about people's power bills, to scare the mums and dads, the Michaels and Michelles in Maribyrnong, 
the Beths and Barrys in Balmain. This is the Labor Party scaring them about false numbers and going against the best advice of our experts, Mr Speaker. Now, today we have announced that the Turnbull government will support a unanimous recommendation from the Energy Security Board. Now, the Grattan Institute, a non-partisan institute, has said today the following. The ESB has given the Turnbull government the last piece in the complex jigsaw puzzle of a credible climate and energy policy for Australia, Mr. Speaker. That is what the Grattan Institute has said today. The head of AGL has said the government announcement is an important step. We are keen to work together to make it work with bipartisan support. It will provide investment certainty, Mr. Speaker. The head of the BCA, as quoted by the Treasurer, has come out and supported this. It has industry support, it has business support, and it is the recommendation of the experts. Only the Labor Party, who is again playing politics with energy, will, will prevent this being the first serious attempt in a decade to get a bipartisan approach to energy policy to get a more reliable and a more affordable energy system. The member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. Will the minister update the House on the work the government's doing for our small business sector to ensure they have access to affordable and reliable energy? How does our national energy guarantee help hard-working small businesses in Brisbane and around the country to grow and create jobs? The Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. I thank the member for Brisbane. He is a very hard-working member and he advocates and supports the more than 30,000 small and medium-sized businesses in his electorate so very well. Like the member for Brisbane, we know on this side of the House that small and medium-sized businesses are absolutely critical to our economy. 97 per cent of all business in this country is in fact small and medium-sized enterprises, and it is critical that we get the framework right for them. Already we have cut taxes for those small and medium-sized enterprises because we know their importance in creating jobs. But we also know that small businesses are impacted by other costs. We know that they are impacted by high energy prices, and more of them, more of them are telling us about the inability to access affordable and reliable energy supply. In fact, the member for Brisbane has, in fact, been talking to so many of the small member businesses on in his electorate morning. and said to one. Uh, that he understands with the Green Beacon Brewing Company, who employ more than 30 people in their microbrewery and restaurant, um, he understands that they are very, very concerned about rising energy costs in their brewing and their hospitality businesses. We must ensure on this side of the House that we keep the lights on and we ensure that they have access to affordable energy supply. And we are going to do that through the National Energy Guarantee. Under our national energy guarantee, we will have a reliability guarantee to make sure that we have the right amount of energy available as needed in each state, encouraging investment in new and existing supply. It will work in tandem with our emissions guarantee and it will ensure that we are able to keep pace with our international commitments. Under our national energy guarantee, we will see affordable and reliable energy for small and medium-sized businesses without subsidies, without taxes, without an emissions trading scheme and certainly without any new carbon taxes. We want to make sure that electricity bills will be lower than forecast, lower than they would have been under a clean energy target. This, of course, is very good news for small businesses. It builds on our existing energy policy, including making sure that we can deliver more gas for Australians before it's shipped offshore, building Snowy 2.0 to stabilise the system, and stopping network companies gaming the system. 
We have already seen disastrous consequences when you get energy policy wrong. We have seen it in South Australia, and we have seen the Queensland government following suit. On this side of the House, we will stand with small and medium-sized businesses, and we will make sure they get access to affordable and reliable energy. The member for Port Adelaide. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I might try again with a question to the Prime Minister. Under the Prime Minister's latest energy policy, what has the government assumed will be the level of coal-fired power generation in 2030 as a share of the national market? Members on my left, the Minister for Energy and Environment. I get the Mr. Speaker, the good news, the good news, is that under the coalition there will be more coal and gas in the energy mix than under the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker, and that is good news for the member for Shortland, Mr. Speaker. That's good news for the member for Hunter. What was his name, Mr. Speaker? What was the member for Hunter's name? What was the member for Hunter's name, Mr. Speaker? Now, it's also good news for the member for Newcastle, Mr Speaker. It's also good news for the member for Herbert, Mr Speaker. The good news is that we will have more, we'll have more coal and gas under the coalition than you will get under the Labor Party. Now, Members under on the National left. Energy Guarantee, coal and gas by 2030 Will be 64 to 72 per cent. Now, Mr. Speaker, under the Labor Party, what will that be? Thermal generation, synchronous generation. It will be only 39 per cent, Mr. Speaker. That's no good for the jobs in the member for Shortlands electorate, but he doesn't matter about jobs anymore. He's forgotten them. It doesn't matter about the member for Hunter's electorate anymore the because he's forgotten for the them. En energy and the environment will resume his seat. The member for Hunter will cease interjecting loudly into my left ear. The member for Port Adelaide on a point Thank of you, order. Mr. Speaker, uh, a point of order on direct relevance. The I member for Port Adelaide will just resume his seat for a second. The minister for transport will cease interjecting. The purpose in me calling the member for Port Adelaide is to actually hear his point of order. So, if I could hear the point of order, that would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My point of order is on direct relevance. It was a very short question seeking a share of coal fired power, not coal and gas fired power. Just coal. Coal. The Minister for Energy and Environment has the call. Good, good, good try to the member for Port Adelaide. You know why he doesn't care about coal anymore? Because it's all closed in South Australia, Mr. Speaker. Because under this plan, the Northern Power Station would have had a much better chance to still be in operation or indeed something equivalent to being in its place. And you know what the great irony is in the member for Port Adelaide State of South Australia, as a result of the closure of the Northern Power Station, I just, they have I now just, been the taking Minister North for Energy and the Environment will just from Victoria. If you just resume his seat for a second. I've listened to the um, to the question very, very closely and the minister's answer. And he's got about a minute to go. He's um, certainly addressed the substance of the question in his remarks so far, but he's now moving beyond that into a more general discussion. So, in the last in the last minute, he um, needs to confine himself to the the subject matter of the question. Port Adelaide gives you a lot to talk about, Mr. Speaker. The good news is that under the coalition's plan, based on the analysis from the Energy Security Board. There will be a 64 to 72 per cent of a generation mix in the NEM coming from coal and gas. As a result of, as a result of Members on this my decision, left. a coal-fired generator is a much more likely to be updated, to be upgraded, to have its life extended. Now the member for Karai has gone quiet. The member for Karai has gone quiet because he knows that in the Latrobe Valley this is good news. This is good news for the people in Latrobe Valley. The member for Shortland is busy reading Mills and Boone over there, Mr Speaker, because he's no longer interested in jobs. The member for the Hunter Minister for the Environment and Energy the will resume his seat. Member Minister for the Environment and Energy will resume his seat. 
Uh, are you asking a question? No, no, I'm seeking. The minister was quoting from a document, and uh, he, as he turned, it's clearly not much confidential. I'd ask that he take it. Is the document confidential? The minister says the document's confidential. The member for Maranoa. Mr. Speaker, Let's my question. On. Is... Member for Maranoa has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment. How does the government's trade agenda uh, create jobs for hard-working Australians, and how important is affordable and reliable energy for Australian exporters? Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches that would threaten Australia's trade competitiveness? The Minister for Trade and Investment. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Maranoa for his question. Because, like those on this side of the house, another person absolutely committed to opening up export markets for Australian businesses, who recognises that it's taken the coalition to open up a host of new opportunities abroad, opportunities which are driving our economy and driving employment opportunities for Australians. I note that under the free trade agreements that the coalition government's put in place, we've seen, for example, John Dee on the Southern Darling Downs. Who's actually credited the coalition's FTAs as being key drivers of increases in global demand for their product. Now that's enhanced future production levels, and we've seen in the member's own electorate that John D now, as a consequence of opening up markets like China and Japan, now increasing full-time employment by more than 140 employees. So that's ways in which the coalition's policy approach on these free trade agreements is really promoting opportunities for Aussies and for Aussie employment. And it stands, frankly, in stark contrast to the Australian Labor Party, because not only do they get the big calls on trade wrong—I mean, you'd recall, of course, the Australian Labor Party up until one minute to midnight were opposed to the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement—you'd recall, of course, that the Australian Labor Party condoned one of the most dishonest and disgusting campaigns that we've seen from the trade union movement against the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement. But we also see an Australian Labor Party that's tone deaf to the needs of our agricultural sector. The Agricultural Electricity Task Force, and this goes to the member's question about threats to our trade competitiveness. Well, the Agricultural Electricity Task Force said, and I quote, electricity costs are crippling the agricultural sector. And that's precisely why the coalition is delivering reliable and affordable energy policy. Reliable and affordable energy that will make a real difference to our competitiveness on the international stage. And frankly, the contrast couldn't be clearer between the Coalition and the Labor Party. Because Australians have a choice. They can choose between the Coalition or Labor. They can choose between reliability or a liability. They can choose between a coalition approach that's going to deliver cheaper and reliable and affordable energy, or they can choose between the $66 billion bill, because that's what the Australian Labor Party promises, a $66 billion bill that will make our competitors more in a stronger position, because Labor's policy, their ideological obsession with renewable energy, their ideological obsession with saying that they will take renewable energy to more than 50 per cent. And we see it exemplified in South Australia, where we effectively have seen the collapse of sound energy policy in South Australia, because they adopted the kinds of policies that the $66 billion bill wanted to pursue at a federal level. The and that's the reason min why, minister, Mr. minister will withdraw that last remark. He, he managed not to—, not to um, uh, refer to the Leader of the Opposition in his earlier part of the answer. Well, Mr Speaker, I withdraw because I wasn't referring to the Leader of the Opposition. Labor's policy will result in a $66 billion bill, and that's the, the choice that Australians has have. Concluded. Member for Hunter will just resume his seat. We'll just... The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's previous answers about savings of $100 to $115 per household under his latest energy policy. Did the Energy Security Board provide any other lower figures to the government about possible household savings? The Prime Minister has the call. I thank the Honourable <coughs> Member for his question. 
the only, uh, the only information I have relating to the savings are contained in the letter from the Energy Security Board that is now, that is now a public document, and that provides the 110 to 115 uh, dollar figure. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition is impugning the integrity of the members of the Energy Shame. Security Board. Who should be members on my I'd left? Ask him to withdraw, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition will not interject. The Prime Minister has the call. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, nothing is too low for this Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. He is now because, having called on us to listen to the experts in the industry, having called on us to listen to the experts in the industry, and when we do, when we get their advice and we follow it, he now wants to attack the integrity of those very distinguished Australians who formed the Energy Security Board and gave us that advice. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, let me be very clear about this. Reliability and affordability go hand in hand. What we've seen in South Australia is because electricity is so unreliable, it is prices have become so volatile. More and more often, you're seeing prices spiking well over $200 a megawatt hour. That means South Australians, including the constituents of the member for Port Adelaide, are paying much, much more for their electricity. They're paying more for electricity and they're not keeping the lights on. So it is vital to combine reliability and affordability and responsibility in meeting your international emissions reduction commitments. That is what the Energy Security Board has done. They have done that in their recommendations, which the government is adopting and will be taking to COAG. And the opposition members, Mr Speaker, who supported and welcomed the appointment of the Energy Security Board, should stop this smearing of the integrity of the Energy Security Board members, which we hear from the Leader of the Opposition, smearing away having a go at their integrity, he should be backing them as we are because they have the best understanding of the market. What they have recommended are, is a reform which will ensure we have affordable, reliable energy and we meet our international emissions reduction commitments. The member for Karangabite. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to media reports in the Colac Herald from September that indicate South Australia and Victoria are facing summer blackouts and major power outages. Will the Minister update the House the on member action— Member for Karanga might will resume her seat. I'm not going to keep saying it. The member for Sydney can leave under 94. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Member for Karanga might can begin her question again and the clock will start. The 30 second mark. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to media reports in the Colac Herald from September that indicate South Australia and Victoria are facing summer blackouts and major power outages. Will the Minister update the House on action the government is taking to deliver a reliable and affordable energy supply to all Australians, and how will our vital health services benefit? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Karangamite, who believes deeply in the importance of keeping the lights on in our hospitals, hospitals such as Colac Hospital, which provides such fantastic services to the people of Karangamite. But as we heard, there are real threats to the ability of member those services to be, uh, to be delivered because of the lack of reliable and affordable energy supply in Victoria. We saw recently the headline, Energy Market Operators Warn Victorians to Prepare for Summer Blackouts, and the message which was contained in that article, Australia's energy market operator <coughs> has warned the state will be in a dire situation in Victoria if it faces an extreme summer, and why? Because of the recent, recent closure of Hazelwood. And that came about as a result of the direct, deliberate intentional destructive policy of the Victorian Labor government. And what does that mean? It means Member that we have Bendigo a is risk to the reliability of our energy supply in our hospitals such as Colac Hospital, Echuca Hospital and hospitals right around Victoria. And we also have a risk to the affordability 
of energy right across Victoria's health service. We saw in the, Co in the Colac Herald the report that Colac Area Health is facing a 78 to 80 per cent increase or an additional $420 to $430,000 cost per annum. So these are real costs that could have gone could have gone to better maternity services, better diabetes services, better health care for senior Australians in the, in the Karangamite electorate and in every other equivalent electorate around Victoria. So that's why we're taking action. That's why the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the Energy Minister have worked on a national electricity guarantee, which is about dealing with the damage done by Labor policies in terms of their renewables approach in terms of their approach to uh, cutting down uh, exploration for gas and their extraordinary actions in blowing up a power station in South Australia and closing down Hazelwood in Victoria. The electricity guarantee is about two very simple things. It's about making sure that there are lower costs, lower costs for hospitals and for families up to $115 a year in reduced pressure for families and more reliable electricity for hospitals and for families, as opposed to the alternative of a $66 billion plan, which comes from their 45 per cent target. And that 45 per cent target means that the costs will be borne by hospitals, by families and by pensioners. At the end of the day, if you believe in Member reliable hospitals and better hospitals, you believe in our approach the to downward Minister's pressure on prices. Has concluded. Thank you, Mr. The Speaker, Prime Minister. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice page.